a squat is just going to hammer the glutes. It just is. Listening to somebody with a PhD is going to give them an edge in training. And it doesn't, like not even kind of a little bit. The way you see people like bounce their pecs, yeah. if you can kind of do that with your glutes or you have an exercise that kind of makes you feel that, that is money. So I want to kick things off talking about your history with strength, a journey that started with training at 13, football, powerlifting USA magazines, and watching Strongman on ESPN2 on Christmas Day. Can you explain what are some of the qualities that separate a good strength program from a mediocre one? Ooh, that's a, man, how many hours do you want to be here for? Um, the most surface level insight I can give into that without getting into too much context is um, it's going to, it's going to hit the big rocks. And this is something I dwell on so much because yeah. the surface level content uh, tries to give recommendations to everybody. And there's some things that are kind of true that generally apply to everybody, but where people get stuck, it's usually something that's a little individual, assuming they're hitting all the, the big strides. And it's like two separate switches you have to have. What are the big truisms that tend to be true for everybody? And then what specifically do I need to pick, pick out for me? Good strength programs are going to be easily accessible. They're probably not going to be overly complicated because most people don't need the complication, at least until if they have some special circumstance or they're way late in their career where they're advanced. The average person needs something that uh, is easy to follow, where they know what the spirit of the program is, what they're supposed to be doing. They can keep track of the progression. There's not too many moving parts uh, because it really comes down to a good stimulating stress. And we know what that is. It's the stuff that's been around for 150 years, a good, a good selection of lifts, barbell lifts, it's hard to go wrong. Um, a good amount of effort showing up, you know, hitting your work and then knowing how to chart that forward. And as long as it's not running you ragged, which is pretty hard to do, that's not a problem most people have, it's going to get you taken care of. Um, so really, I mean, if I were to answer that from the other end, like what's a bad strength program, what's something to avoid? It's going to be something that you're likely uh, to lose track, uh, to lose track of, to find overly complex, um, where if there's a problem, you don't know what angle to attack it from because you're not really sure what the program is supposed to be doing anyways. Uh, or it, it is something that is going to run you ragged. There's a couple, I call them bucket list programs because people take them on as like challenges. They're very notorious for how rough they are. Um, and they're super like sensationalized. They're almost mythical. But I always steer people away. I'm like, this isn't going to teach you anything about what most of your programming is going to be. This is probably going to wind you up with like tendonitis or some overuse issue. Um, most people have to stop short because they can't sustain it. The people that do sustain it and see a little bit of progress, they can't run that afterwards on end, really. So there's a few like that. But for the most part, most of the templates, linear progressions, um, basic programs that are arranged in kind of a digestible way, it's hard to go wrong. Okay. And you mentioned that there's kind of some specificity or maybe like individualization, like what would a, like an intermediate lifter want to look for, um, in a program that maybe they can figure out how to tailor it to themselves? Sure. Um, it gets hard to answer because so much of the decision-making that you make is arbitrary. And people don't like hearing that they like, if there's two choices, they like to hear that one's better than the other. Yeah. There are so many avenues and this is a weird thing. And I think it really throws a wrench into exercise science. I really think it throws a wrench into uh, the sphere. It should be empowering, right? That there's so many options, but it's the opposite. It's like FOMO. It's um, the paradox of choice. That's really what people get, uh, get wound up in. So, I like to direct people back to making sure you've kind of selected something or stumbled into something that you're excited about. You like it fits your life. Now, assuming you have that and you start making steps forward, intermediate's very broad term. It assumes that you've been training for a little while. You have something that looks like above average levels of strength and fitness. You've probably already come across your first plateaus where you've done something long enough to get better. And then it's kind of not working. And the big question of how to keep going that if, once you figure that out, you figured out how to get strong for like most of the rest of your life. Uh, the, the, you know, 
dreaded plateau is really what sidelines people because we don't really know why muscle stops growing or why gains happen. We just know diminished returns come for everybody. So if you're an intermediate and you're at that level, you need to look for something. Uh, sorry, you need to look for changes that are addressing the exact reasons why you stop growing. And it usually involves something to do with novelty, inserting something that's a little bit different, but it has to be in this Goldilocks zone because if it's way off, uh, you know, on a different island, it might not have anything to do with what you're doing. For general fitness, that's fine. You know, you can bounce around and try all kinds of different things, but if you actually are trying to get stronger and stack that forward, it has to be kind of in the same bandwidth. Um, novelty, it has to address recovery. That's another thing. As you get stronger, the balance of stress and recovery changes a little bit. You can kind of say you need more work to get yourself to push forward. But at the same time, because you're stronger, every bit of hard work has a bigger recovery cost. So that dynamic changes a little bit. And a big problem people have is they try to go harder, 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 and they end up burning out. They end up backsliding. Their numbers might go down temporarily. They get really frustrated. So managing recovery is a big one. That's where people will start to look for like deloads or programs that progress you forward and then reset. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bunch of different ways that they'll in incorporate that in. Um, and then specificity is a big one. The farther you go, as you get more advanced, as you get stronger, you need to stop looking at very broad development where kind of everything works. There's no real wrong answers. And you need to start looking at specific things. And it's a bit different with everybody. For some people, it's, it's uh, solving that technical glitch that's been holding them back. Or there's some muscle uh, along the chain that's kind of the weak link that they haven't really targeted. Um, for some people, it's exposing themselves to something that they've just been avoiding. Some people don't like to do a lot of work. And you might find that at this point, there's no way around it. I really have to start prioritizing more volume in practice. Some people might not like to push very hard. It might get to the point where there's no way around it. I have to learn how to kind of sack up and, and get aggressive. So it is very different for everybody. But, you know, addressing your needs, making sure you're recovering, um, making sure that there's an appropriate amount of novelty, that tends to be how you mold programs to yourself. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you talked about kind of that Goldilocks zone because there is a certain amount of, I guess like problem solving and critical thinking that you need to do as you become more advanced as a lifter. So I kind of imagine that when you're doing program design, that's probably a challenge as well, because you want to make it simple, but also not so broad that it's not useful. And you probably also don't want it so specific that you're covering everything that it's just confusing. Like, is that a challenge? hundred percent, a hundred percent. This the relevant variables that are probably holding somebody back or that could potentially be addressed to solve some problem. If you're really going to sit down and try to count them and we're back in like abstract philosophy territory where you're like trying to count, you know, all the different types of forms in the world or whatever, like the number of things that you have to count, they're not really countable. We have a sense of them. We kind of have an idea of how to define them and talk around them, but you're not going to put them in a flow chart. Uh, to apply them to a specific algorithm. You just can't do that. This is, and I keep going back to this idea that there's very much a science behind this. Like, obviously we're made of physical stuff and it all follows the same rules and we have an understanding of how humans adapt in a pretty good way. But to get specific, you need to have an intuition. It's more of an art form. It's more, we're trying to find patterns and apply what we think would be true in this situation given everything that we've exposed ourselves. That's why there's no real uh, replacement for just getting your hands dirty, having a lot of experience with yourself, a lot of experience with a wide variety of people, because you don't know about the exceptions and all the weird shit that kind of works its way in yeah. until you've had so many different types of people that you've experienced these problems. And it's one of, it's one of the things that like gives you heartburn, keeps you up at night. Cause if there's stakes on the line with an athlete, you're trying to get in their head. You're trying to anticipate things you can't possibly anticipate. And there's almost a point you'll like break down and you'll be like, God, do I even know anything? Oh, and man. then you have to kind of come back and, and again, go back to the big rocks. What are the big notes that we're, we're checking? Um, what's the risk of trying something new? There is an element of experimentation that has to happen. You do too much of that. You're never going to go anywhere. So you still have to have the foundation of consistency. That's a weird thing to try to balance. Um, and it's also one of the reasons that I've been, salty towards the field of exercise science and a lot of the evidence-based influencers 
because I feel like there is a huge, huge negligence uh, in not mentioning that at every possible turn, because there, there isn't real certainty. And you can watch as many different people as you want, but until you get in, apply yourself and not just apply yourself. You have to like work it, tweak it, try to problem solve long enough to know that, that this did or didn't give the right answer uh, before you can really kind of move on being like, okay, let's try something new. Most people think something didn't work and they kind of gave it lip service. Like there's so many ways that you can sink into something and, and really try to milk it for all it's worth. So there's no getting around that, that aspect of self-discovery. Yeah, absolutely. And I find this discussion around exercise science really interesting. And I've interviewed some of the folks in the exercise science field. They're, you know, they're good people. Sure. But the one thing that kind of I can relate to is I come from the startup world. And I've had a successful startup. I've exited to Google. And I would not look for advice from a PhD of entrepreneurship. I would look for someone who's actually done it before. And I'm not someone who's highly educated. I kind of just did it. So I kind of come from that experience side of things. Now I do look at best practices on very specific things and I figure out when I want to implement it. So I go by feel quite a bit. So when I speak with people that I mentor, they look, they want the answer. And I'm like, you can do a startup and you can follow every best practice and it's not guaranteed that you'll be successful. And people don't want to hear that. So I am curious like, what is your biggest frustration when people are saying, just follow the science? Oh, man, that is such a hairy can of worms. Um, what's fresh in my mind from the arguments that I get into or the discussions I have is um, the definitions, like exactly what it is it that you're talking about when you say that. Um, that's a very broad term to the point where it's almost useless and people just kind of pack onto it their uh their own intuition or what they associate it with and it's one of those things it's a shortcoming of language i think where we very easily talk over each other's heads uh, i get labeled as anti-science because i'm talking down or criticizing a specific scientific uh domain or discipline um where i'm not anti-science science is like the crux of everything we have in the world but Science requires skepticism. It doesn't just happen as this static thing uh, where, oh, the scientists got it figured out, just kind of defer to them. There's always uh, pushback. There's always friction. There's always trying to find the things we don't know. And then there's this question they have to grapple with, which is at what point do we know enough where we're really justified in making a firm, a firm conclusion? And when you consider how much statistical power you have, how many things we don't know. Like, that's a good question. But what does the study not tell us specifically? And if you ever go through a junior college basic science lab, biology or chemistry or physics or whatever, and you're looking through any amount of research, I mean, you get graded on your ability to look at a study and say, what specifically can you say about this? But more importantly, what does it not say? And that's a big problem. And the science communicators will talk about this openly, but it goes over the heads of a lot of people because people aren't listening to them for that. They're listening to them because they think listening to somebody with a PhD is going to give them an edge in training. And it doesn't like not even kind of a little bit. And that's a huge misconception. So if people are being honest about what exactly you can say or not say about the research, and if they compare that to what I was talking about coaching, trying to work with somebody and anticipate all the things that are important, the galaxy of things that you don't know in the context you can't apply. I mean, it gets immediately to the point where just trying to find the right answer with the individual you're working with or with yourself is uh, the most important thing. And the starting point, I mean, lifting has been around for 150 years. It doesn't deviate too much. Good movements, a lot of effort, consistency, a desire to improve. You start taking notes um, applying new, interesting things as you come across them, but really taking notes about, Oh, this worked really well. I should retain this and kind of letting go of things that are frivolous, complex, or gimmicky. And at the end of the day, it, it's a pretty straightforward roadmap. Um, the best lifters, I'm like, okay, they're good. Genetics is going to be a thing. PED use specifically genetics of PED use, how you respond. But even with all that, the people that love to train natty or not, Mm -hmm. blessed or not. I don't think I have good athletic genetics. I never, I played five minutes in three years of football in high school. I have like a three inch vertical, no Olympic lifting coach in any continent would ever have selected me for their team. 
but I love to train. I love, like, I love to train and there is no, um, there is no value you can assign to that in an objective sense. And that's why I think I've been able to over 20 years last compete at a pretty high level, continuously progress. Um, and you're not going to get that out of a, out of a 12 week study. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, uh, you hit that, you know, right on because when it comes to these type of topics, I think it comes back to our earlier discussion around being able to think. I think people want the answer and they look at exercise science as a way to not think. But if you use it as a tool to think critically, it's an additional tool, right? Okay, let's look at this research. Let's see if and how I could apply it and if I want to apply it and if that makes sense. From the actual data side of things, uh, we did like large data studies at Google where we'd look at, uh, you know, quantitative data for like 10,000 users in an app and how it worked. And still product managers would pick out the pieces of information that help get their projects approved because incentive drives behavior. And I'm not saying that's what's being done, but it's always important to be skeptical because that's an inherent human nature thing that happens. Um, so just be skeptical of that and wait for more research to come out sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to, I don't want to, this to turn into my uh, my rant against academia or um, or these whatever you might think of as like a corrupt system or whatever. But in, there's there are a few things that are universally true no matter where you go, no matter what domain you occupy, and the incentives for human beings to uh, do things that help their status at the expense of some virtue or principle. It's the most normal thing in the world. It exists in all of us. Nobody is exempt from it. Smart people aren't exempt from it. The smartest people, especially if you get a few of them in the room, are amazing at convincing themselves that either they're justified or what they're doing really isn't that bad because they're doing it. The highest professions you can think of, doctors or politicians or CEOs or whatever, bad behavior. It's, it's human. We're not perfect. We're flawed. And that's why you need checks and balances that are aggressive at doing that. Um, there's also kind of a, a thing in... Um, lifting culture kind of the way it exists right now there isn't a lot of aggressive conflict which is really bizarre i mean there's a couple characters that are known but they're kind of ostracized when people get together they usually don't push back very hard um mm -hmm. nobody's really being called out in person which is kind of weird and it's not that i like the drama farming but there's some really contentious points and um positions that people will hold up that don't really get challenged. And I think that's especially true. I've never seen anybody in the field of exercise science get together and really have it out. And I know there's disagreements. Of course, there's professional disagreements. But mm -hmm. seeing that friction, uh, there, there's this illusion, I think, that everything's kind of been figured out, that we know more than we actually do, that you can give specific recommendations to broad populations, and the scientists have, kind of have it figured out. And I just I don't think that's uh, that's correct at all. So I like to see... Uh, not just skepticism. I like to see aggressive, like accounting, um, you know, wh where's the exact limits of, of what we can say and not say. Um, and as it stands right now, I mean, if you look at the, and this has been beaten into the ground, how rigorous the studies are, uh, the statistical power, how many people are there, the, the variables they don't take into account. They can't say anything about how a variable works in the context of different programs. Can't say anything about genetic uh, variation from person to person. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't say anything about, this is the big one, long-term. Remember, diminished returns come for everybody. Nothing says, okay, this worked really well in this six-week or 12-week group. What happens after six months? What happens after six years? Do we find something that's better and then you just do that forever? That's a very, very, very important question. And um, they don't have anything to say about that. And the messaging ends up turning into, people interpret it. Uh, whether this is a fault of the communicators or not, people interpret it as, oh, this is the answer I was looking for. Like you said, they're looking for a way not to think. Mm -hmm. There's no way around that. There's no way around thinking. You have to live that plateau. You have to live the point where you get stuck, where the thing stops working. And it's not going to be real comfort when you're like, but the thing I'm doing was the optimal thing, according to the research. Uh, everything has to mold to yourself and uh I feel like this messaging pushes people in the wrong direction where they try to lean on that when they're infinitely better off 
I hesitate to say go by feel. You said you're an entrepreneur, and I know that instinct is uh, is hugely uh, important for the type of things that you and people like you have done. Um, the average person isn't going to have that entrepreneur killer instinct. So you do want guidelines, but the important thing is the guidelines are simple enough. They're accessible enough where you, you don't need to complicate it. You don't need to read research. Even if you do read all the research and you really hold what, what it does or doesn't say, you're, you're not going to be better off for it. And that, I, that's something I've been taking a task on a couple of times because people don't like to hear that. Awesome. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw some quotes that you've said in the past, give me your kind of first take on, uh, you know, that quote. So the first one, it is, it is not the mode of stress that causes spectacular growth. It is the mode of progression. Yes. So this goes back to what I just said, where the important thing, it's not what you do that works today. It's your ability to continuously get that to work for you. A lot of the, a lot of the answers that people look for and it's this kind of tangled hierarchy because the market exists to satisfy the consumer. So like the consumers, the consumer is looking for this specific answer at this specific level of complexity. So those are the types of answers that people are coming out online trying to give them, which is what will get me strong today? I'm going to the gym right now. What's the best thing I could do? And that's like the first level of complexity. It's like dimension one mm -hmm. um, to go from there, what you do today, well, you have to come back next week and do it again. And then you have to do it again and again and again and again. And anybody who spent sufficient amount of time in a corporate gym knows the guys who have been lifting in the weight pit at a 24 hour fitness for 30 years, lifting the exact same weights for the exact same sets and reps they look about the same and they're fine with it. It's their hobby, their pastime, whatever. Um, that, isn't sufficient. There has to be, if we want the excessive growth, if you want to trick your body into holding more strength and tissue than it ever has any reason to ever hold, <laughs> there has to be a little bit more to it. And the progression, that dimension, it's not today. There's so many things that'll do something today. It's what is your pattern for progression? Exactly. What are you doing next week? How many weeks can you do that before it doesn't even work at all? And then what do you switch to? And that's a thing that escapes a lot of people. If you can kind of solve the question of how do I progress predictably where I can put a six week block together and know as a matter of fact that I'm going to be better on week six than I was on week one. And then I know, okay, things are starting to slow down. What's my game plan? Do I go into a different block that's a little different? Do I do the same thing, but just kind of switch the mode of progression? There's, there's options there. But once you get a handle on how that ebb and flow works, dude, you're made in the shade. You can grow all the way up to the world platform, you know, it's just wash, rinse, repeat. Awesome. All right. Next one is 10 rep maxes are more important than one rep maxes. Yeah, I like that. That's one of those truisms that I throw out because I think it just casts a wide net. It's appropriate for most of the people that are listening. One rep maxes are fun. They're useful. Of course, they're strength specific. Uh, the average person is not highly developed. So the general rule is in all sports really is you go from broad to narrow. So if you jump in day one into the most specific thing you can do, uh, you might see some growth from that, but that certainly isn't going to be the smartest way to approach long-term growth. You need a foundation in youth sports. You have kids play a lot of different sports, not because they're going to be the best in the world at all of them, but because that foundational skill that they get, it's like driver's ed for your body. You learn coordination, you learn about your recovery, you learn to strain in different ways, hugely valuable, but eventually you get better and you sharpen down to the tip of the spear and you pick one thing and try to be very good at that. So anyways, the uh, average lifter is in a state where they generally need more muscle tissue. They just generally need more work mm -hmm. and they can get a lot of mileage out of doing things that have the greatest overlap. So a 10 rep max, pretty good for building strength but it's really good for building muscle. It's really good for teaching you what strain is. Uh, it's easier to progress because there's more, and uh, you're working across different thresholds and energy systems. So there's a little more like elasticity when you're trying to push forward. Uh, whereas a one rep max, people know what it's like to go in and just go heavy, 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 heavy. Mm -hmm. And you're either having a good day where the weight's gonna move or you're not. And it's like, well, shit, what do I do? I had a bad day. What's my plan B? Uh, there isn't really one. So for all those reasons, more people are better off for long stretches of 
chasing 10 rep maxes. And that'll solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think the challenge is it's a lot harder to get hyped up to do a 10 rep max than do a one rep max, right? Like in my group chat, it's harder to be like, yo, I just got this 10 rep max, right? It's, it's less exciting, right? So I feel like there's, you know, we talked about enjoying working out. So I feel like I think people know that, but still they don't do that. Like they'll go to the gym going, I'm going to really work on my 10 rep. And then it ends up being like triples because yes. it just naturally that's more fun. So I feel like that sometimes people know what they should do. And then it's still hard to actually do that when you get in the gym. Yeah, those associations are huge uh, because you have to build that association between the thing that is uh, like Dave Tay puts it a good way. He talks about it's like, OK, you do the thing that's going to like improve your game. So if you're a powerlifter you're trying to deadlift, OK, what things improve my deadlift? And he's like, and then I work the things that improve those things that improve my deadlift. And it's kind of, you know, working back. Um, putting yourself further and further away from the thing you really want to focus on. But if you put all your attention there, you're going to burn out. If you build an association that this is the, the foundational thing that is really what's holding me back. And you learn to love to do that the way you love to go in and hit a one rep max on a bench or a deadlift, then you're just, you're going to be more well-rounded. You're going to have such an easier time growing. You're never going to be hard up for a good workout. Because wherever you don't have it over here, I know the other foundational things I can work on. You can always find something to chip away at. It's it's a hard thing to do, but once you do it, it's a game changer. Yeah, so it's funny is like YouTubers love making tier lists. And uh, I make tier lists for myself for certain right. things. So I play tennis. I made a tier list of like what I'm good at and what I'm bad at. And then like six months later, I took a look at it and like moved things around in the tier list. Like it's there you go. super meta, super nerdy, but I'm like, okay, like these are the weaknesses. These are the strengths. I'm naturally, uh, I'd naturally never give myself anything S tier because I'm always like, I can be better at this, but yeah. that's my nature. But <laughs> no, but that that's fantastic. That conceptually that's spot on the degree to how much, you know, you build a, an Excel sheet around it or whatever. Um, and I know people that go that route. And again, it's what fits your personality. Um, I would say some people can do the paralysis by analysis thing and spend too much time nerding out on minutia that they can't really do anything about. But as far as being very aware of where you're lacking and, and the things you don't like doing, the things you know you avoid that are probably good, uh, and the things you spend way too much time on, I would say that is not a problem that the average trainee has. All right. I'm going to move in a different direction here. Lifting weights is not an identity and it won't make up for your other failures. If your relationships, finances, and other obligations are circling the drain, the only thing you are doing by locking yourself in the gym is guaranteeing fewer people show up to your funeral. Damn. I, I, I wrote that. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, uh, that's something I believe. Truly. Um, and I have to be specific about who I'm thinking about because there's a lot of people that might get triggered at that that shouldn't be because I might not specifically be talking about them. There's this balance we have to strike because I firmly believe lifting can add so much to your life, but you have to go about it in a certain way. I also believe it can detract things from your life if your house is not in order, if things are burning down and you're using this as an escape or a coat or an identity. And I see, I'm not going to say I see a lot of that. The identity thing, I think I see a lot of in general strength culture. Um, I spent so much time competing, uh, handling people in powerlifting meets. I've been in something like 50 or 60 strongman shows over the years mm -hmm. and seeing the novice division, seeing the, the different weight classes, seeing how these strengths kind of, uh, these strength sports kind of grow and evolve and the type of people they attract. As the guy who was like the insecure lifter, I was the fat, awkward kid getting sand kicked in my face that wanted to have a little bit of purchase in life. Um, I relate to all of them that show up looking for that self-improvement, looking for the community and the validation. It's all very intoxicating. That's what got me in early on. However, there's also a kind of consumerist driven market uh, that it, it grows. People get paid by appealing to more people and they appeal to that sense of identity that people get without getting too like, I don't know, philosophical or trying to psychoanalyze people. Uh, I really think that there is kind of a profit driven model where you get more people at your meet. If you give away more trophies, uh, if you kind of solidify the sense of identity that people have and turn this into more than a hobby, it's like who you are. 
And I think it takes people in kind of the wrong direction because you have to be able to kind of laugh at yourself. We're all in the first world, so privileged that we can artificially exhaust ourselves because we don't do real labor in order to put food on the table um, for, you know, endless days and nights. Uh, we have an excess of calories. And because we're in this frivolous activity, you know, it's we get a past time. Uh, but it's also something that genuinely solves problems and adds, adds uh, to your life as long as you're mindful enough to see how it can kind of make you stronger, um, provided you're, you're focused on the right things. There are a couple of knuckleheads. Bodybuilding, I think, is worse with this. But there are some fringe examples of people that really were like, I'm late on my rent. Uh, my relationship's a mess. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm about to be living out of my car. But, you know, I bought a bunch of chunk light tuna and I made sure I have my uh, pre-workout and I'm still making payments on my gym membership. And, you know, they'll go work out for four hours. And it's like, bro, maybe go get the job interview, you know, maybe, uh, you know, get some of your stuff worked out. Maybe just killing yourself on a, another set of uh, squats, another drop set of curls. Is it going to be the thing that fixes you? That's kind of a separate problem. But I think it stems from the same way. People looking for something in this that they weren't getting somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you're training, if you're at like a 90 out of 100 and your other stuff's a 20 out of 100, like get it up to 50. Like that probably makes sense. It does, you know, training can still be your priority, it could still be a huge part of your identity, but don't let the other stuff fully fall apart. Um, and you're talking about first world. The most first world thing I can think of is like if you go to a friend's house and they have like one ply toilet paper, you'll judge them. That's That's first world life. Absolutely. Oh, com completely. Um, you know, the, oh, you bought the cereal in the bag, not the, not the box, you know, like, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the toilet paper thing's a big one. And I say that we only have three ply in this house. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very specific one. The one at Costco isn't good enough for us, apparently, according to my wife. So that's okay. No, it's like, Hey, just be fortunate. You're not, you know, using a t-shirt and wiping it in the dirt. I don't know. All right. Um, so now I want to ask kind of a, a fun question here. Uh, what is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises to get larger glutes? Larger glutes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think how to tackle this. Okay. So the biggest rock that you can move with your glutes is going to be just something that has very deep, deep hip extension. Um, something that allows you to move a lot of weight. You're, you're going to have a hard time doing better than a squat. A squat is just going to hammer the glutes. It just is. Now there's some weird stuff that can happen. This might, I don't know. I'm going to wait for the physios to get into a, a war with uh, everybody else. So there's controversy over this type of stuff. Talk about like glute activation or whatever people lose their minds. Um, there seems to be some weirdness that can happen with complex movements where just because two people go through the same movement doesn't mean the same things are happening the same way. I believe this has been demonstrated with things like gait, you know, like the way you walk mm -hmm. where, you know, the nervous system and pattern and coordination, it's a bit weird. I have known and worked with people who um, squatted, squatted even kind of, kind of impressive amounts of weight, but had no ass. I've, I know those people. I've worked with them. That's a thing that can exist. Um, and I don't know what causes it. I don't know to what degree you could call it activation. Now, I think of when you're trying to get the most out of a movement for a specific muscle. That's more of a bodybuilding tactic, although strength athletes absolutely are better off knowing how to do this because you use it for variations to shore up weak points. It's helpful to know, to conceptualize, to feel where the muscle is. And that's where activation stuff kind of comes in. Even if activation really isn't a thing, so mind muscle kind of is knowing how to tense and work and recruit is very important. So I'm inclined to throw in some activation stuff in there, even though it's not going to be a primary driver of hypertrophy, just because it's that thing. It's that thing that gets better, the thing that gets right. you better. Um, so anything that gets a pump in your ass is going to go in that box. So people argue day and night are uh, glute bridges an effective uh, hypertrophy movement and they'll run their studies. They'll talk about motor unit recruitment where the, you know, uh, uh, peak forces occur in the movement. And uh, they'll point out how the muscles stretch, but it's not really under a load when it's stretched. And that's not ideal. Glute bridges are amazing at getting a pump in your ass. 
Okay. You feel your butt contract. You have no doubt that your butt muscles are squeezing. They burn at the top. Uh, in fact, there's a couple movements where that the contraction, which usually isn't thought of as like the most hypertrophic uh, part of the movement. Usually, I mean, people focus on the stretch. But I remember doing like keg loads over a bar in that moment where I had to like shove my ass forward and I'm trying to lean back. And I felt the skin on my butt tingle <laughs> from that contraction. <laughs> so that's what I think about. So if you have that sense... The way you see people like bounce their pecs, yeah. if you can kind of do that with your glutes or you have an exercise that kind of makes you feel that, that is money. That will help you tie together okay. everything. Uh, as far as weighted movements, it's super easy. It's going to be squats. Um, lunges are fantastic. Deeper the better, probably uh, up to an elevation or something. Um, um, and then everything else is going to be like a variation of a squat or a lunge. Uh, leg presses. I mean, if you get your feet high and wide on a leg press and you take it deep and you strain, you're going to have a hard time not feeling that in your butt. Uh, I would probably avoid smaller movements like um, kickbacks. I mean, technically the, that's going to put the forces there, but it's kind of weird. It's awkward. It's not how your legs really designed to move. Um, I'm not saying you can't get anything out of it, but it's probably a little more uh, nuanced, but like uh, when in doubt, I always go to some squat or lunge type movement. And then if I'm going to throw a fourth one in there, um, probably a hinge, a hinge with just a ton of resistance at the top. Um, I mean, deadlifts, RDLs by themselves are really good, but the glutes really come in at the very, very top. And that's where you're mechanically the strongest. So to be a little complex, throwing some bands over an RDL to where okay. it's tightest right at contraction, probably going to be a really, really good hinge movement to get your glutes uh, lit up. All right, so we got squats, we got leg press, we have RDLs. Did we have a fourth? Lunges. I think, lunges. So I, okay. I'd say squats and lunges are the big two. Leg press, high and wide, is is a good accessory to that. And then uh, RDLs. I mean, deadlifts. Any type of hinge is going to be good for the glutes. But if you really are focused on the glutes, that's where bands, some type of accommodating resistance that makes it hardest at the top, is is going to hit the glutes a bit more. Awesome. What about like carries? A uh, carry carries are fantastic. As far as growing the glutes, when I think about growing something, I'm usually thinking about going through a full stretch shortening cycle. You want you want the muscle expanding and contracting. That's not to say isometric movements or, or limited range movements can't do anything. Carries are fantastic for your entire posterior. Uh, I like them more for conditioning and strength. And most people aren't going to go the strongman route. The amount of carries I do for my sport probably uh, is probably a cause of a lot of the hypertrophy I've gotten in my posterior over the years. But I do like an unreasonable amount of strongman events uh, for somebody to throw in carries a couple times a week. Like it, I put that as GPP. It's very broad. Okay. Uh, it's good for conditioning. It's good for general strength. I think they're fun as shit. If you get good at them, I think it says a lot about your physicality. Um, I probably wouldn't throw them in as a pure glute movement. Um, but they're, they do so much that you can justify it either way. Okay. And the activation, you would do that before you did squats, for example, like you do bridges before, uh, to kind of activate the, the glutes. Is that the, Oh yeah. The way to uh, use it? Uh, yeah. I think I threw in too many exercises. You asked. No, me. no, we're, we're counting that as a bonus, yeah, right? right? Like you have to do the activation yeah, and then, and then there's the Mount Rushmore. I think that's, that's right. That's right. It's a primer. Um, yeah. Doing it before is a great example. Um, having a sense of the muscle moving before you do the heavy lifting is very valuable. I experienced that in my triceps. Nobody ever really thought that like a really high rep, like cable or band press down is like going to just grow meaty triceps. But after I do it, I'm so engorged with blood. I can kind of like twitch. I'm like, wow, where did that come from? When you bench, it feels like you have a different handle there. It feels like there's another gear and you're aware of it in a way that you never were before. You can do that with your glutes. And if you've had a hard time getting them to grow, it's going to change the way you approach those other movements. And the strain is going to end up where you want it. You're, you're going to be more deliberate and conscientious through the movement. So yeah, I, I would do, um, and you can go two legs, single leg, you throw bands or weights, but I would focus on high rep, a nice squeeze, get some blood in the muscle again, get that twitchiness going on. And that'd be great. And that's something you can also do because they're pretty easy to recover from. You can do them whenever you can do them on your couch. You can do them in between downtime. You know, you can do it. Any, any extra volume you add in 
is is a bonus uh, for the type of people that are of the mind to do something like that. Awesome. So we were just talking about strongman. So powerlifting and strongman have gained popularity over the last decade quite a bit. So when are you proud of strength sports and when do you roll your eyes? <laughs> uh, always, always both at the same time. Um, no, I'm, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like Hank Hill uh, and King of the Hill um, and strength sports are my son, Bobby, <laughs> because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like immensely proud and I you know, love it more than anything. But then there's also times where I'm like, oh, that boy ain't right. Um, when am I? Uh, so, OK, so the beauty of strength sports, the reason I love it is because my core beliefs about what people need to be OK, not just OK, but what people should be striving for to make themselves better in kind of every sense of the word, but also in a way that reinforces everybody else around them that kind of, you know, leeches up into the community dynamics, which, which should in turn reinforce your own position. People need physical activity. They just do. I mean, I'm sure you can find people that are reasonably healthy, well-adjusted, happy with no physical activity, just like you can find smokers that live to be 90. Um, the template for a happy, healthy human being is to live in the environment that we were evolutionarily programmed to live in. And that's one where we use our bodies to do shit. Uh, strength is great because it solves so many problems. Uh, bone density uh, allows you to do more things. It teaches you uh, problem solving, how to strain, how to be uncomfortable, how to hold standards for yourself and not fall apart. So from your physical body all the way up to your character and the way that you solve problems, it's fantastic. and. With strength sports, not only do you get a direct avenue to that, you stand on the shoulders of last 150 years of innovators and people experimenting and making their way. And it's this discipline. It reminds you of martial arts in a lot of ways, but it's like so much more accessible than martial arts. You get, you should be getting a lot of the same values and character development um, and things that legitimately augment your life. Uh, but it's more accessible. It's more easy. Anybody can do it. It's super scalable. Um, there's so many things I love about it. You get into the community aspect and again, that's what brought me in. I remember my first strongman meet I ever did. I was 19 years old. This is back in 2006. Uh, I thought I was strong. And then you show up and you see people that are, you know, closer to seven feet than six feet tall, 350 pounds picking up just plates and plates and plates like it's nothing. And it was the most humbling and terrifying experience ever, especially I, I think the one I did uh, didn't have weight classes. So I think we're all just lumped in together. Nice. Just like this little, <laughs> yeah, I was like a fat 220 pounds and I'm going against these giants. Um, but everybody was super friendly. Everybody was super helpful. Even the guys that were kind of known as not friendly still wanted you to know what they knew. It, it was the coolest experience ever. And that is what got me in. And uh, I think this kind of trend of people wanting to kind of capture people in and help them and, and mold them, that's that's ubiquitous. That's about everywhere. I roll my eyes when it starts to get back to the consumer's dynamic. It's kind of like the customer is always right type thing because that is how people get paid. Um, some people have financial motivations to do that. Some people, it's like the thing that keeps them relevant. It's like, how many people can I influence or, or mm -hmm. capture? And it creates a very anti-sportsmanship kind of uh, environment that I've been critical of in the past. There's a stark difference between the people that have played team sports, where there is that direct accountability, and people will chop you down if you puff your chest out before you've earned the right to do so, or if you get a little bit too big for your britches, uh, mm -hmm. or if you have opinions that you haven't earned yet. That doesn't exist so much in these kind of individual, like pay to play sports, um, Interesting. which I think should. I think uh, the sport is missing out hugely from that. And I think everybody would be better off if they did. But there's a real fear in uh, telling people no and checking people and being seen as a person that's peeing in anybody's Cheerios. Um, so it's a, it's a problem. I don't know the best way to go about it. OK, yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's a natural thing for a growing sport, if that makes sense, because yeah. in order to grow it, you want to be as like easy and customer service oriented and make it delightful for everyone and inclusive. But you also don't want to take away the, the core 
of what existed for kind of the original folks. So like that's always a balance in, in things like sports. It's even a balance in things like movies when they do like a remake. Like you want it, you want it to work for like the new audience, but you want it to work for the old audience. And if you just focus on the new audience, then you make these crappy Star Wars movies. And <laughs> oh like, man, you want to talk about uh, crappy remakes, man? I'm your guy. But that that whole that whole dynamic um, is 100 percent true. And okay, you want to talk about where I roll my eyes? There's been a tagline in Strongman for a long time because powerlifting's been around forever. It got way more popular when they brought raw lifting back probably some 20 years ago, it started to get popular kind of on the back of CrossFit. Um, CrossFit helped out a lot with that actually, but strongman was still very niche up until about 10 years ago. And in the forums, it was always, we got to grow the sport. It was very like proselytizing. And I was in the back with a couple of the other weirdos that are like, why, why do we have to grow the sport? Like we like to do it. We know why we like to do it, but if growing the sport just means more people know about it, but if it becomes more commercialized, if the thing that is neat about it gets watered down, um, is that something that we really want to do? It really comes down to where the draw is. Pro sports are dominated by the top, by the elite, you know, um, you foster the most competitive environment. You select the best talent. That's what people want to watch. So you have a viewership base. That's who's paying the people who, watch ads so that they can watch the big game or whatever. But then you, it's all about the team, the sport, the environment. You can be very selective about who you pull up. This is very bottom up because the people paying are the athletes. They're the people that want to feel part of the sport. So I'm all for growing the sport. I don't know that I love the idea of growing the, uh, the kind of consumer driven aspect of the sport. Um, I want as many people training, competing, participating as possible but I think the draw should be on finding ways to make the top, the elite, the highest performers, uh, the most marketable, um, drawing in the most eyeballs, because that's going to bring in more money. But that's mm -hmm. also going to make sure that the sport is focused on standards and exceptionalism and uh, paying athletes, because this, this shit is not a paying gig, which is why every world champion, if they don't have a YouTube or a, an IG that's popular, you know, they're going to have a hard time buying their, you know, 20,000 calorie uh days worth of feeding you know you know they go broke pretty quick so yeah it's not it's not the uh, nba where scrubs are getting 18 million dollars a year like the 11th man on the team i'm like who's that okay <laughs> absolutely yeah and uh yeah i i, dude, I could go on i could be i could talk about weight classes everybody, <laughs> everybody needs a trophy because i never wanted it to turn into powerlifting powerlifting became uh, okay. as fast as it could if you this is a fun uh, experiment for anybody out there go to openpowerlifting.com and look through all the different uh things that you can select for um different categories you can get a trophy for and multiply them across uh and just get an idea of how how many people that is it's many thousands more than there will ever be in a single meet. And if you go to a powerlifting meet, you see them carry in a box. They'll have hundreds of first place medals Wow! Um, for a meet with like maybe 80 people in it. It's crazy. Um, but that's that sells. That was very, very popular. And that's why they're doing it. Strongman used to be heavyweights and middleweights. When I started, they didn't even have a women's division. I had Kristen Rose, a good friend of mine, she, uh, her, uh, her and her husband were at my wedding. Uh, she's the most decorated strong woman in history. She's a huge trailblazer. Um, she started competing in strongman um, a little bit before I did, but we were in a lot of the same meets. She had to compete heads up with the guys because wow. there, was no, there was no women's division back then. Crazy. And it's great that there is now, but uh, we went from just having the heavies and the middleweights to now there's empty weight classes at the bottom. They go down to like 175 and there's like four people there at nationals every year. And then there's masters. And each, anyways, uh, it just, it gets to the point where it's like, okay, what are we doing? Here? It's diluted, right? Like, I, I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. so. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, so I want to talk about the relationship between unrealistic male body standards and its interaction with screen time. So I love how you related the teachings to one of my favorite books, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb on this topic. So for the people listening, how should they approach engagement with high achievers and rare body types, which is what they're doing all the time on YouTube and Instagram? So admittedly, we are in uncharted territory, right? With social media, because there's a couple points I go to. The big one is how do we handle a society where everybody is being put face to face with, it's everything our grandparents told us about TV, 
but like a billion times worse and yeah. all the time. Uh, and the, the bit of research I did into that and the things that I've, I've kind of read and picked up over the years seems to point to it's not what you're exposed to. It's how much you're exposed to it. So the, the real insidious part of social media, I mean, the, the machinations of it are that it trades like your uh, your attention for that dopamine hit. And it's just constantly trying to keep you engaged. Not great. But it's the fact that you do it for eight hours a day, legitimately eight hours a day yeah. of screen time of it's it's the time in between on your phone scrolling through time you're waiting for something or whatever um so there's two points for for the exceptional standards that we're seeing now there's the absolute highest performers that we see so that bar has been shifted because we've gotten immense uh, immensely more talent uh we've gotten way more participants <laughs> That you can select for these freak outliers. Um, we have uh, a lot of drug use, which exists. So the freaks of the freaks of the freaks are like unlike anything we've ever seen. They're aliens, and there's a lot more of them. We also have the whole bell curve being shifted. So the average is probably ticked up a little bit more. And you can relate that to, you know, it's that question like, is there more of this now? Or are we just seeing it more? It probably doesn't matter because even if there weren't more, social media would mean you're seeing more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the big thing we have to grapple with. I like to remind people that expectations are not necessarily other people's problem. They're your expectations. There has to be some responsibility. We were talking about having kids at the beginning before we went on. And I was yeah. like, the biggest problem me and my wife faced with having a newborn, it's not that they're so difficult. They are. But we kept shooting ourselves in the foot because we had expectations for how our day was supposed to go. And that ruined us. So having unrealistic expectations is something you as the person with expectations has to adjust. And that's something you have to play into. And people will go all kinds of different routes. They'll go body positivity, which I, I understand it, but I think it's misguided. I think it's too incomplete by itself. Um, people that go to NFL games, people that watch the Olympics, uh, people that go to, uh, I mean, in the past, people could go to a bodybuilding show and wouldn't leave dejected because they witnessed excellence that they don't possess. This is the big thing I worry about. It's not that people feel bad because they haven't, um, because they're being exposed to things that are outside of their reach. It's that at some point it's being reinforced that they should expect to have that thing they don't have, which is, it's a bizarre point. Yeah. It's a bizarre way to engage with anything out in the world. Uh, I like to remind people when they're feeling depressed or dejected or like there's just too much greatness out there and they're never going to measure up. The number of ways that you can demonstrate greatness in your life, it's this galaxy of different things that you could potentially do. And you don't need to do all of them. You don't need to do five of them. If you have like two things that in your sphere of influence, your real life sphere of influence, yeah. you're kind of known for being competent in those realms. That's it. That's all you have to do. It's the yeah. easiest thing in the world. And mathematically, it works out. Literally, everybody can do it. Everybody can be the person in their group that has some exceptional thing that they do, something that they're known for, some point of competence or whatever. And that's all you have to do for dating. That's all you have to do for friends, for family, for whatever it is. That's all you have to do. So knowing that the time spent on social media is a thing screwing you up, spend less time on social media. Social media is not going away, just like entertainment doesn't go mm -hmm. away. Professional sports doesn't go away. People should be able to engage with, you know, the NFL or with, you know, anime characters that are stupidly overly muscled without having a tummy ache or feeling inadequate. Um, so remove yourself from it if it's uh, consuming your life, but recognize that your greatness and your success in life, nobody ever got great because they went from 18 to 22 inch arms. You know, no, I mean, nobody ever like established some foundation in the rest of their life yeah. when you're talking about the big rocks like you're drowning you're overweight you, you don't have energy you have low self-esteem and you make that big transition in the beginning to being kind of fit in good shape that's massively transformational diminish returns you're going to mm -hmm. kill yourself for every bit of growth and it has nothing to give the rest of your life so as long as people remember that i think they should have an easier time navigating this environment yeah, absolutely. I think a couple of things stuck out there. So I've done a lot of research on this screen time because I have the uh, digital citizenship product that I sell to school districts. So a big part of screen time is 
separating active and passive screen time. So active screen time is when you're creating something. So you're like writing a book or you're making a YouTube video. Um, gaming's kind of in the middle. And then passive is that mindless scrolling. So screen time isn't bad as a whole. You just need to be doing more active screen time and less passive screen time. Okay. Um, and then the other part is kind of narrow, narrowing your focus. Um, I went to the Arnold Classic and uh, I was worried ahead of time. I'm like, oh, I'm probably going to have body dysmorphia when I go there. That was my joke. And uh, I did it because I think I've narrowed my focus. I'm like, okay, I'm like 40. I have kids. I'm Indian. I have pretty poor bodybuilding genetics. So in that small little realm, I'm in pretty good shape. So I felt totally good there. I know I'm not these other people. I'm not trying to be them. So for me, that's a lot might be easier than other people. Um, but I think if you're able to kind of narrow that that focus of who you are, then you're comparing yourselves with people similar to yourselves as opposed to, you know, the top of the top in the field. That's huge. And and also it's not just like a hierarchy that's vertical. It's it's an entire matrix that you can look at because you're, I mean, you look like you have pretty low body fat. You look like you're pretty fit. You could probably go through a conditioning workout. You could go to the Arnold Classic and you can walk around. You come to my side of the aisle where we have all the strong men walking around. Yeah, there's guys that can deadlift 700 pounds, but, you know, have bad facial hair, are 80 pounds overweight, have gyno and acne. Um, there's so many different things you can look at. And to them, they're like, hey, I, I'm winning. I'm the king of this hill. Mm -hmm. That's all I care about. And that's the thing. You find the hill that you care about. Rank yourself accordingly. Um, you know, people, life is not uh, this uh, like paid cruise vacation where we popped in and we paid for the premium package and we should be able to go see all of the things we want to see. And if we can't, then uh, there's a manager we should talk to. We have limited capacity. We're all moving closer to uh, the horizon where our life ends. In that time, we can only do finite things. We're best off if we focus on the ones that bring us joy, that also overlap with our abilities to do them in the first place. And where you find those, you can find these little ponds where you can be super happy. You can stand out. People that intimidate the shit out of you might be coming to you for advice. So it, keeping that, keeping that um, perspective it's not just going to make sure that your mental health is better, which it absolutely will. It's going to make sure you're actually more effective at doing something worthwhile to begin with. Yeah. And I think it comes back to, you were talking about body, body positivity. I think it's more about having the right standards based on who you are and your sure. life goals and how you're set up both genetically, mentally, et cetera. It's like just figuring out what those standards are for yourself and try to meet those standards. But I think there's, you know, we go back to that art and feel thing. You need to be able to figure out what makes sense for you, where you're happy with it and you're still pushing for goals. Yeah, it's hard with, I mean, there's this grand problem people are always trying to solve uh, and they treat it as if there is one algorithm or one answer that's going mm -hmm. to satisfy everybody in every perspective. I completely understand that we want a world where, um, you know, if you're overweight, you uh, you're not miserable as a kid. You're not bullied or made fun of. Uh, you don't have people constantly chirping in your ear uh, to, you know, get your shit together or to try to subtly give you diet tips or whatever. Like you understand that you don't want this to be a main feature of society. But the other perspective that works directly in opposite of that, you also don't want a society where people are dying decades before they need to, mm -hmm. where people are limited in their life. And similarly, where because we normalize something out of kindness and not wanting to be mean to other people, you've actually influenced a whole entire ocean of people um, to inadvertently take this uh, take this path when they didn't know better, when they were able to be influenced. And that's what a lot of people who are overweight cite. That was me when I was a kid, when I was eight. I mean, my mom laughs. My first words, she, according to her, I don't know that this is actually true. Um, we were going through a Carl's Jr. drive through and I started yelling, chocolate cake, chocolate cake, chocolate cake. Uh, <laughs> and the big joke was I, uh, you know, I loved uh, bacon Western cheeseburgers. That's what I ate. And I don't know if they have Carl's Jr. up there, but uh, the, they're the shittiest yeah. barbecue burgers you've ever had. The bacon is like 
something that looks like it was synthesized in a factory. Uh, but God, I love them. I love those soggy onion rings. I love it so much. It reminds me of my childhood. But I, that was a running joke. I was like, like, what are the best birthday gifts I got? I was like 10 and I was fat. They got me a mini fridge for my room, you know? And it was like, they didn't really know any better. But the way that you get influenced, by the time you take evaluation of what is important to you, what you want to change, you look back and you're like, well, I really didn't have agency all along or the influences of society things that were normalized, things that I wasn't really pushed back on. I wasn't funneled. Human beings have to be funneled. We can't, you didn't invent calculus from scratch, but you use it in your day-to-day -day life with the technology you use or whatever, you know, emerged out of that. Human beings left alone don't make very much. We have to be funneled according to, uh, you know, the stuff that came before. So it's, it's a hard problem to solve. You're not going to be able to find the exact algorithm that doesn't challenge anybody's self-esteem, but also keeps droves of people from being morbidly obese. Um, you know, it's, it's a real hard thing, but um, th that doesn't mean you don't stop. You don't stop trying to move the needle in a better direction. Um, and I mentioned the book anti-fragile. So I guess, what are your takeaways from that book? I found it, you know, really insightful. Yeah. The, um, the overarching premise is one it's kind of funny when you like get through it and you see it it's almost being presented as a new i don't know movement ideology whatever but it's so obviously foundational to like everything it's something a lot of people i think intuit it's something i think you could pull out of just about anything uh that's seen as like effective self-help or psychology or even if you're getting down to biological systems like just the basic premise that if your the basic premise that it's not just stressing you and you're able to like avoid the destruction, but the stress is actually integral to you growing beyond what you otherwise would have been. And I mean, I think he, he said in the book, I think he said in the book, anti fragile, that that's the term he coined because there wasn't really a term to describe that, which is very bizarre. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there is some obscure biological term that, uh, that, describes it besides just adaptation, but you can look at psychological development, you can look at physical development, and you can look at these more, um, more elaborate systems that emerge when you get many people together where you need friction, you need something pushing down in order to, uh, in order to get the best possible outcome. One of the things I think about a lot is, uh, how we exist kind of in between two different pressures and people will, kind of gravitate towards one or the other and then, you know, implode from the pressure, or explode from lack of it. Uh, I think of like guy wires. That's an analogy I use when I talk about bracing for like the spine because the spine stays upright like a cable tower does because you have these, te these uh, tension wires placed on either side that pull in opposite directions. Um, it's like a fish at the bottom of the sea. It, you know, you pull the fish up to the surface it explodes. You think of the tension that exists. It's crushing, but you have this organism. It was designed. It was made. It came about uh, to live in that pressured environment. And only with that amount of pressure, only with that crushing pressure, can the fish do anything at all. And that's just like us. Uh, I think that relates, uh, obviously, to social pressure. Um, the pressure we put on ourselves, the expectations people have of us. And I don't think you get anything that looks like a strong capable, let alone happy, intelligent, well-adjusted human being, unless there is a basic understanding that you require discomfort, challenges, obstacles. It's not about wanting something and then getting that thing that you wanted. It's it's baked into the hero's journey, right? It's, it's all of yeah. that. It's, it's one of the most uh, popular uh, tropes to get discussed into the ground over the last like 10 years. But it's the idea of starting somewhere you get moved out of your comfort zone and you have to go through this trial that leaves you transformed and different than when you started. And that there's a reason that's baked into every story that's existed in the beginning of time, because that is what makes us who we are. We're, we are change. We are what happens from one moment to the next, from one era in our life to the next. Um, that doesn't exist. That doesn't exist without pressure. There's nothing worthwhile that happens without an obstacle. So if you know that and you can live in that Goldilocks zone, if you can live in that, that middle range where it's more, it molds you, it's transformative, it's additive, 
that goes back to what I talk about training. Training is just the balance of stress and recovery. You need okay. sufficient enough stress to grow. Somebody might look at it overly simplistically and think just stress, 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 stress. No, that that will grind you into the ground and be very detrimental. But if you can balance out that recovery aspect, then that stress becomes the most transformative thing you can imagine. It'll turn you into something that makes you unrecognizable. Yeah, absolutely. I use anti-fragile in such a different manner. Um, so I, I invest in stocks and I have an anti-fragility framework that I use because there's certain companies that you can just buy and know that no matter what happens in the world, whatever like black swan happens, they're going to come up ahead. So an example would be like Amazon. So it's like anytime something crazy happens or tech advancement happens or world issues happen, like Amazon benefits from it because they're anti-fragile. Okay. Other companies might just do okay. Some companies might go under. Like Amazon always is able to take advantage of every situation. So they're an anti-fragile company. They actually enjoy the stress because it helps them grow and build new markets and disrupt other markets. So what do you credit that to with Amazon? Is it just that they're so big or is it that is it their approach to just always be capitalizing on whatever opportunity pops up? Yeah, so I think a part of their their moat, so for anyone that doesn't know, moat is pretty much like what's your competitive advantage that no one else can do. And it's that they are willing to take innovative bets on everything and they're willing to fail. They have the mindset of an inventor. So you have lots of companies that are really big, like Walmart used to be really big, Sears is really big, but they don't exist anymore because they weren't always trying to take, they didn't have it in their DNA to always provide more value whether it be on the logistics side of things, the AI side of things, the cloud services side of things. So it's a, it's a company DNA type of thing. So that, okay, that's interesting. So, I mean, that relates back to like a biological system. It, it has right. these different departments and the bits of variation can uh, be selected for at the right time. So you only need to hit a couple of times and you end up with this, this, uh, what revolutionary thing that survives that that adds to the company? Um, That's Amazon, right? They have Prime, they have cloud services. They do have a couple of that have taken off, but they've tried like thousands of things. And you don't hear about some of the small little failures because the ones that pay off, it's, it's not baseball where you can get a home run, right? Like you can get like a thousand X or 10,000 X. So it's worth them taking those bets, but not all companies have the DNA to take those bets and execute on them. There's a whole discussion there that I keep trying to have. And I've thought about trying to make content around this. I don't know that I'm educated enough or eloquent enough to get it across. And I don't know what exists out there that would even be useful for getting this down. But like a realistic, like objective, actionable bit of advice on like how to work that balance of risk versus reward. Because with lifting, with life, obviously, with business, but like with lifting, I talk about experimentation, self-discovery. It's hugely important. Mm -hmm. But there is that that risk because you can experiment with something. It could derail you from something that would have grown you pretty well. But you went, spent time over here. Years are numbered. Effort is numbered. But being able to stand on uh, on that tower and kind of look down at the map and parse out those, those uh, ventures that you go on to, and kind of guess what the likelihood is that it'll pay off so much so that it was worth the time and risk. Um, intuitively, it makes sense. You have to be able to like move out and try new things, but it seems like universally people either go way too far and they're yeah. just forever experimenting and not getting any ground on the foundational stuff, or they're just, they're just hunkered down in the same thing and dying like, like Walmart or Sears or, or whatever. And I don't know what the science to that looks like. If you could even say that there is a thing, yeah. but, uh, but getting an intuition around that is, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, look I at think, Amazon being able to grow. I think, I think the difference between a company and an individual is there's a finite amount of time and a finite amount of training and recovery that you can do. Sure. So if you experiment in one direction, you're taking away from the other. Well, Amazon can just hire new engineers and say, try this. So I feel like for a company, it's easier to do that type of experimentation with an individual. Like you still want to do it. But if you know you have a plan that's going to work, like you're a beginner, intermediate lifter, and you're like, I could just do this for the six months, then does it make sense to experiment? Like, I'm not sure. 
no, the, yeah, you're right. The, the cost, the potential cost is like way too high. Um, it, it would be nice. And you would think that you'd be able to look to like uh, exercise science or even just old texts or, or wisdom out there to be able to inform that decision. You can to a degree, but it's very vague. It's very surface level. I imagine I like to go off into like sci-fi land and think of like what could eventually be in the, the coming decades or whatever. And I, I have a feeling like if you could co collect enough data the way that so many of these tech companies do, I mean, you work for Google. If you could just capture the data and have the processing power to engage with it, I bet there would be some surprising conclusions you could pull out of it that would be more specific and individualized. Uh, I don't know where you would get that from. People are using apps now to record their workouts. You have to worry about mm -hmm. them recording it accurately. But certain points, like when to pivot, when to try something else, or the types of things, given your background, that might benefit. I don't know if that's ever going to be substantive enough, but that's, you know, that's off in the future. For now, mm -hmm. I'm sure, and for now, simple, stupid. I'm sure we're headed in that direction. And yeah. we probably just went like way too nerdy for the average person listening, but that's okay. So uh, I'm going to go in a different direction here. I'm going to throw some images on the screen. And uh, for the first one, it's a book. You can tell me what you learned. And then for the other ones, uh, there'll be some people and I'll give you some advice. So the first one is this book here, Power to the People. What did you learn from this book? Power to the people. So this is Pavel. Pavel's put out so many books and I've read most of them. Um, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe this is the one, um, let's see, he gets into depth about um, the different types of cycling. So he covers like linear progressions, step loading, wave loading. So I like this because he gives a very simple example of how to progress. It's it's adding weight, but then he gives you a couple of different models for adding weight that can address the uh, that stress recovery balance dynamic that I talked about because you can't just add five pounds forever. So, you know, staying at the same weight for a few sessions, then bumping up, that gives you more time to adapt without burning yourself out um, or waving. That's something I use a ton, building up and then dropping back. Uh, he covers a radiation in here, which I really like, which not a lot of people talk about. Um, Radiation, it's like when you go to shake somebody's hand, if you squeeze your hand, you'll feel your bicep, your tricep, your shoulder tense up. Um, okay. That's a powerful tool for cueing and strength sports. Mm -hmm. um, building tension in one area, the radiation, it kind of builds tension everywhere else, so it makes you more efficient. So you can get more out of an exercise for developmental purposes by really like bracing your midsection. I call it cannonball bracing, trying to stay as tight as you can and expressing that through the entire movement but also for demonstrating on a platform. It's huge for squatting, deadlifting, pressing, making sure there's no strength leak because if you're soft anywhere, you push up. That means something else gives. Um, that he, he had a lot of good wisdom. It was a very good kind of surface level view of, of training uh, from a perspective I don't think a lot of people get. Cool. Next one is, uh, what did you learn from the movie Whiplash? <laughs> ah, man, it went deep. Um, <laughs> Man, Whiplash is one of my favorite, like, pre-workout movies. Like, there's really? a movie I watch, and I just want to get up and, and go train afterwards. And I and this is what I think about when I talk about relating weightlifting to other things in life, other domains where you can be excellent in, but also, like, the morals you pull, pull out of it. Um, you know, balancing that, that seed of craziness that makes you want to just go ape shit and sell everything out to be the best. And it's different. I mean, everybody thinks they can strap on the wings and fly close, close to the sun. Most people don't even have the option. So you, you can judge people, you know, the rock stars that burn themselves out. But when you're there and you're like, no, I could, I'm like right there. I could go just a little bit harder and be the guy. Mm -hmm. um, and then to watch the dynamic back and forth between, I mean, there's a lot of psychological underpinnings. I like the dysfunction that exists between them. Um, but really just watching somebody kill themselves, especially in service of something you don't think of as like this aggressive uh, endeavor, drumming, trying to be a musician. But when you see him and his fingers are bleeding and he's sweating and he's suffering, it's like, I can relate to that. I know what that feels like with a barbell. Um, it, to watching everything decay. I talked earlier about the people selling their lives out when everything's falling apart. But um, God, the big thing I learned... Uh, I don't, I don't know that I actually learned anything from it. It's just, it's such an interesting case study of just, of, of what is this really toxic dynamic that can build up 
but you're still like a fly to this to, to a light bulb you're still like drawn to that greatness there's something inspiring but also kind of tragic about it um yeah that's one of my favorite movies awesome all right for the next ones you could tell me uh if you learned anything from the person and also what training session would you have with them if you met them in person sure kaz bill kasmeyer oh man uh this so this is a complex one um I, kaz is so many people's idol i i look up to him for a long time. I still look up to him uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I feel like Kaz would have gotten wine steamed if he was around in today's era. Um, I think it's Kaz got a lot of shit. I think uh, for as much as people laud his uh, or applaud his mindset, um, I think there's reason to think he was probably a bit of a bully back in the day. Okay. Um, there, there's some testimony to that. And I don't want to sit here and like slander his character or whatever. Um, I think there's uh, there's something interesting to be pulled out of there as far as the toxic champion mindset. I mean, you bring this back to Whiplash, another uh, documentary I really like, uh, Last Dance. It gets into the Bulls with like Love Michael it. Jordan. You want to talk about toxic champion mindset again? It's like you have the ability to get close to the sun. Are you going to? And, and what are you going to do for it? Um, That's some Michael Jordan stuff right, right oh, behind there me. You go. Right behind there me. You go. Yeah. yeah. And there's something about that that you can't help. And other people are different. Some people will be very judgmental and vindictive off the bat. I can't help but uh, almost have a sense of uh, respect and admiration for it, even though you acknowledge it's not the right thing for most people. It shouldn't be celebrated as like a universal goal for people to, uh, to strive for. There's huge amounts of cost going that way. But also there's an argument to be made that you only get the best performers out of that. And it's, it's a very weird thing. It's almost like, you know, the way, you know, you can look at uh, rituals where, you know, they worship death, you know, Santa Muerta. It's like, it's like the way you look at death as a saint is different than the way you would look at like another typical Catholic saint. There's this reverence I have for it, but it's a little kind of puts a bitter taste in the back of my mouth. Anyways, Kaz, fantastic athlete, exceptional genetics, God knows what he would have been if he uh, was alive in this time. Um, but uh, an obvious example of um, training insanity and being willing to handle an immense amount of work with a complete irrational belief that you're not only going to make it out in one piece, but you're going to dominate everybody on the other side. There's a lot to take away from that. Um, so, yeah, he's still like he's still on the list of uh, one of one of the guys from the past. All right. Next one is Ed Cohn. The thing I liked about cone is a uh, very uh, workmanlike approach to training. So Kaz embodies kind of that um, you call him like the id <laughs> of training or mm -hmm. he's, he's very uh, the, the kind of visceral and emotion and, and, and passion just directed is like this energy blast. Uh, cone was methodical and procedural but not in the way that you see with a lot of like overly complex, like Soviet systems, like God help you. If anybody's cracked open super training and looked at that stupid mess, this is like the workman like ethic of somebody that was like a carpenter or just a long time engineer. He knows the variables. He keeps it simple, but there's a system. It's not like no, no, uh, it's not like the decisions don't matter at all. They matter, but there's just everything simple and contained. So to hear him talk about his approach to periodization, planning out numbers, being able to hit them predictably, wash, rinse, repeat. He had a few things he anchored to the wall that he focused on, and everything was just clockwork, the way a carpenter would do it. And uh, the fact that he's, as of right now, Hack's probably going to take it over, but as of right now, he's still considered the greats of the greats. Uh, to see that from someone like that, especially with his calm demeanor, and he's he's very humble, soft spoken. I think that's incredible. Awesome. And the last one here: What would you train with Kong? <laughs> what would I train with him? Yeah. Um, what would the workout session look like? Man, it'd be it'd be shrugs and and uh, and front raises with those traps. You got to work for those gorilla traps. Um, no, with uh, it, it'd be uh, it'd be some type of loading event because I have short arms, so uh, I suck at uh, hugging things, picking them up off the ground. So when you have a training partner with a high ape index, uh, it's extra it's extra motivation to do better at the things you suck at. 
Awesome. All right. I'm going to end today with kind of a, a fun and difficult question. So I know you're a movie buff. So what are some movies from the 90s or 2000s that you recommend often for people to watch? That I recommend? I can't remember the last time I recommended. Or that you would recommend. Like, would what are recommend. some good go-tos? So, okay, I have to set all of my uh, stupid nostalgia aside because the, the, the movies I think of first are the ones that... Nostalgia is okay. You can have nostalgia's your nostalgia. okay. Yeah, go for it. Uh, it I, so the, the movies that I get most nostalgic for, it, it, it's one of those things where it's like Star Wars. Like you mentioned Star Wars. I feel like a lot of people, if they weren't alive in the 70s to see uh, Star Wars when it came out, there's an experience they were missing out on. And okay. so people can capture it after the fact, but it's not quite the same. I don't think anybody could experience like Die Hard or Independence Day. Oh, it was huge. Yeah, oh, yeah, my know. God. And when I think of the blockbusters that existed, um, it's not it's like the special effects were better than the 80s. They were getting better, but they still by now you look at it, you're like, oh, my God, that's awful. But there was a vibe to the movies. There was a bigness and an energy. It was the orchestra music. And I feel like the actors were uh, they could carry a movie a lot better back then. Um, anyways, uh, so I get nostalgic for that. I don't know that I'd ever recommend somebody go sit through those. If I think about the movies that were like impactful, um, late nineties. So as I was getting closer to high school, three movies came out around the same time. I think that had a huge impact on the way I look at things. Uh, cause they all had the same theme, but they all took dramatically different ways to look at it. Uh, fight club, American beauty and office space all had essentially the same theme or they overlapped heavily. But Office Space was an absurd Mike Judge comedy. American Beauty, I think, won Academy Awards, a really poetic, kind of a dark comedy, but very dramatic and, and uh, contemplative, like kind of artsy movie with Kevin Spacey and Annette Bening. And then you got Fight Club, which was one of my favorite movies to this day, um, just because of the layers that you can kind of peel of like philosophical insight, but then paired with the style. And then you just have like Brad Pitt in the era where he was like carved out of glass. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyways, a lot of good characters in that, but it was all about like consumerism, um, which is funny. I think as you look at how we've evolved over the last 25 years in society, since those movies have come out, um, I think there's a lot to be taken from those and the commentary uh, now that everything's souped up with, Amazon and social media and whatever uh, to go back and look at kind of the purposelessness of the worker bee type life and uh, what it's like, especially as men to try to find purpose and grounding in something. Yeah. And we're put into this framework that's very dry and has oppressive lighting, <laughs> that, that blue office lighting that burns your eyes and uh, everything's meaningless and, and monotonous and repetitive. Um, yeah, I, I love those three are some of my favorite and they all came out right around the same time, just as like a an exercise in philosophy, I think. Fight Club has a highly underrated soundtrack too. They have like the they have like yes. a bunch of the tracks from like the Pixies and just like it's just good music. I had that I did I had it on C D and I had every that every time. Every time that Pixie song comes yeah. on, it's like it's burned into my brain. Like I went through some clockwork orange brainwashing i hear that guitar riff yep. and i see the soap in the intro yeah. and I see edward norton watching the buildings fall at the end every oh, time man. and i kind of get chills like it amps me up a little bit yeah that soundtrack this and that was when the um the cinematography was new where uh I think like Steven Soderbergh was doing a lot of stuff with like the really like saturated like harsh blues yeah um, the you can look look at any movie like a year or two before that and then look at Fight Club and there's a sharpness to it and kind of a, a darkness to the cinematography that uh, didn't exist before. But the, visually, it was very impactful. Yeah, that I think that movie um, stands the test of time. Yeah, it does for sure. Awesome. Oh, Bromley, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Where can everyone find you? No problem, man. Um, you can just search my name on uh, YouTube. That's my uh, biggest presence. Or you can go to Brahma Rama on uh, Instagram. I do some stuff there. Uh, and then there's quite a big library of stuff to sift through. So you can keep yourself busy. And you have a training app. I do have a training app. Yes. Uh, Base Strength AI takes uh, three different periodization templates that uh, have been pretty popular for my books. 
Uh, Base Strength is uh, the book I'm known for. It's available on Amazon as well. Um, but it takes the um, it takes those programs and personalizes it to you by using your input to manipulate volume, give training recommendations. There's a ton of analytics, so it makes it. Uh, adjustable makes it viable to everybody. So I'm really proud of how that came out. And those can all be found on my website, basestrength.com. It's a hub for all that stuff. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. Thank you. Appreciate it.